So I wanted to carry on with just um, the next uh, next uh, topic, which is um, variance. And um, the sort of uh, resources are a package called uh, Variant Tools and another package called Variant Annotation. And this actually points to a tutorial that Michael delivered at the there's an annual <coughs> annual bioconductor conference in the in the summer. Uh, it'll be here here next summer next dates are set next uh, summer July. Um, and um, with sequencing, you are um, calling um, uh, variants that differ from a reference genome, and it basically requires high quality reads. And furthermore, you're interested in evidence at the nucleotide level. So you're interested in depth of coverage at the nucleotide level. That's actually different from ChIP-seq and RNA-seq, where we are kind of thinking about one read, one vote. And here it's important to think about coverage of nucleotides. So um, you go after a longer paired end sequencing to get uh, uh, the, the, the coverage of uh, individual nucleotides. And, uh, the alignment requires effective aligners that are going to take into account the nuances of the structure of the genome. And so you'll sort of reach for the high-end aligners. DWA and GMAP uh, are examples of those aligners. And there's a, um, uh, there have been published studies that compare the strengths and weaknesses of various aligners. And within Bioconductor, typically you do these alignments outside of Bioconductor, but actually the GMAP aligner is, is um, wrapped in an R package called GMAP R. So you can incorporate uh, the, uh, the, these really nuanced align alignments in, in using uh, an R package. So that's the uh, ali alignment. And typically you have, a, you've done a relatively deep sequencing, and so you have lots of data. And the reduction is to sort of moderately sized data. What you're going to do is somehow visit each nucleotide and um, look at the reads that have aligned, uh, that overlap that nu nucleotide, and look for nucleotides that differ from whatever reference sequence uh, you're using, or where there's polymorphism within the reads. And the usual um, uh, reduction is to so-called VCF files. A VCF file has a genomic coordinate, uh, or perhaps an, 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 a range indicating an indel, a genomic coordinate, and then a description of the of the variant itself, like it's it's a C instead of an A, and um, and then maybe additional <laughs> population level uh, summary data, so additional columns. For instance, um, you sat, surveyed a thousand individuals in the thousand genomes project. So for this variant, you know information about it's a C instead of an A at this genomic coordinate, and then for each individual, you have a summary of their genotype. Um, uh, 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 homozygous or heterozygous, and um, the evidence that supports the, the called nucleotide. So a typical VCF file is sort of rec rectangular in structure, where each row represents a variant. The initial columns describe the variant, and then subsequent columns describe the variation across the population. Uh, the usual um, approach is, is to calling variants is actually outside R and uses something like GATK or other non-R tools for actually calling the variants and doing the reduction stage. But actually, um, um, uh, one of the ironies of the Thousand Genomes Project and the efforts to identify variants in the human genome is that, uh, you know, these studies were done where You'd send samples independently to the three co uh, contributing institutions in the consortium, and you'd come back and ask, well, what were the variants called by center A and center B and center C, and do a Venn diagram, and actually there's surprisingly inconsistent results that the three circles of the Venn diagram, despite the expenditure of, involved in doing the sequencing in the, in the variant calling, the Venn diagram um, actually showed very little overlap between the the, the variant callers. And so it's actually surprisingly difficult to call variants. And furthermore, you have different types of studies, like um, the GATK pipeline is kind of a population level variant caller. That's how it was um, designed, calling variants of, uh, 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 of an individual relative to a reference. Whereas in a, in a cancer setting, you have uh, typical sort of paired tumor normal samples 
and the variance, the frequency of a variance could could reflect the uh, um, relative proportion of the tumor in the in the sample that you you've drawn. So it's um, so that the sort of challenges are different, and um, so that leads you to want to have some sort of flexibility um, that goes beyond these standard um, <laughs> facilities. And so within R, there are a couple of opportunities. There's this package called Variant Tools, which has some built-in ways of calling variants based on sort of a particular statistical approach, but also exposes to the, the user the um, ability to construct their own variant callers at genome scale. And then another really interesting package is called H5DC, which um, uh, takes a different approach. So most of these reduction things goes from BAM files to VCF files. And the problem with that is that um, the VCF file contains information of called variants, and you don't know whether you miss the variants that should have been called. They're not represented in the BAM file. They're only you only know that you missed a variant by going in the VCF file. You only know you missed a variant by going back and looking at the BAM file and discovering that your algorithm missed that variant. Um, and so the H5DC <coughs> package takes a different approach. It says instead of using the, the reduction phase being this VCF file, what we're going to do is come up with some way of representing the whole genome, um, each individual nucleotide, and knowing that at that nucleotide position, the reads support this number of A's, C's, G's, and T's with this level of quality. And then that makes it particularly easy both to go forward and say, I'm going to scan the genome and call variants using my favorite algorithm this way. But also, if I have some question to go back and look at the data again, it's really straightforward. You don't have to manage these huge VCF files. You just consult your um, the, the, the file format that it uses to interrogate that position and, and find out whether the variant or the lack of the variant was um, is supported by the data or the nature of the support from the data. And so you take uh, like um, sort of uh, the, the, the ten, uh, hundreds of, um, gig, literally hundreds of gigabytes of data in a BAM file and you reduce it to um, say five or six gigabytes that fits on a thumb drive and you can carry around um, in your pocket. Uh, and then um, that makes it really flexible for um, both going forward with developing novel variant calling algorithms and then interrogating the da data when it comes time to asking whether those variants that you've identified are really well supported or whether your algorithm has gone astray. And then um, it's, some of these studies are, are, uh, are um, great. They generate like the consortium level studies that gen generate lots of data and you need to um, think about the analysis and comprehension of the data or of the variants that you've called your, yourselves. And so you want to take the, <laughs> the VCF file and ask questions about the variants, like are the variants close to genes? Do they cause um, changes in coding sequence, introduce stop codons? Um, what can I say about uh, the variants per se? And uh, the variant annotation package is used for reading VCF files. You can treat it kind of like a database where you say, I'm interested in this particular region, pull out all of the variants that are in that, that region. You know, using a rearranged object to specify the ranges that you're interested in. Or you can uh, sort of page through it, like uh, uh, and process all of the variants in a VCF file. And then variant annotation has facilities for asking sort of basic questions like, is this variant located in a coding region or a non-coding region or promoter region or, or whatever? And uh, if it's in a coding region, does it cause an amino acid substitution or is it a silent substitution? So you can ask all of those questions within variant annotation. Or you can take the variants and send them off to Ensemble's variant effect predictor, which has a more elaborate set of effects that can be used to annotate the variants that you've discovered. There's also an interesting package called Somatic Signatures, which um, builds on the H5DC uh, package. and um, looks for somatic signatures of single nucleotide variants, including spelling mistakes. I guess, uh, yeah, so th that's the variants. So really, yeah. Yeah, structural variants. So um, 
So in some ways, actually, the um, so I'm not sure about a mature package, but the but the um, actually there are packages. There are um, there are packages. Uh, there's uh, at least a couple of packages that address stru large scale structural variants of that sort. Um, like I was almost going to. The package I'm looking for is uh, high C, for instance. Um, so, so I think so. The an so the answer is so some, something like this, right? Like the large scale structural variance. So the answer is there. There are some limited number of packages, but I'm mostly going to fumble around not being able to identify them. But there, there are definitely a couple of packages, and also the G ranges infrastructure is kind of ideally suited to discovering those types of variants. You go after reads that are mapped, paired ends are mapped to unusual locations. 